was unbelievable was sorrowfully believed. By a bullet fired by a single man, the president was killed and the entire nation was wounded. I would like to say a few words about the John Fitzgerald Kennedy Library. Many of you who visit other presidential libraries and know about the custom of establishing libraries to house the papers and memorabilia of every president when he leaves the White House. My husband had looked forward to retiring to his library at the end of his time in Washington and making his headquarters there, as President Truman does in Independence. That is why he chose the site for the library along the Charles River in Boston, near the scenes of his own youth at Harvard and in the midst of the varied educational community of eastern Massachusetts. He wanted the library to play an ongoing role in preparing young men and women for lives of public service. He visualized it as a vital center of education and exchange and thought. Almost all of what the president and his family bring into the White House and collect there while they make it their home leaves the White House with the passing of power. While it is true that many personal belongings of the presidents are enshrined in their former homes, beautiful houses such as Mount Vernon, Monticello, and Ashlawn, for many years there was no one place where people could go to see all the things representative of a particular president and his administration. Not only personal objects, but important papers of state, treaties, and speeches. The year 1939 marked a change in this pattern. A joint resolution of Congress established the Franklin D. Roosevelt Library, located on the 33-acre site in Hyde Park, New York, near the final resting place of the President and Mrs. Roosevelt, and not far from the Roosevelt ancestral home. On the second floor in the president's bedroom is his wheelchair, rarely photographed, looking somehow unaccustomed to disuse. At this desk, the president wrote many of his famous speeches, such as the one he addressed to the University of Virginia. On this 10th day of June, 1940, the hand that held the dagger has struck it into the back of its neighbor. From earliest childhood, Franklin Roosevelt was an avid collector of everything. Ship models, marine paintings, books, manuscripts, and stamps. His room recalls a vivid picture of the man we remember. It has been kept exactly as it was on the occasion of his last visit. Like every world leader, FDR was the subject of both serious study and caricature. This, one of his favorites, was unveiled at the 1940 Gridiron Dinner in Washington. Within the complex of home and museum are all the elements required to keep alive the image of a great man. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The full text of this film speech, as well as many others of each administration, has been made available through the resources of the National Archives. In 1955, the Congress took a second and most important step, known as the Presidential Libraries Act. 
and under it was established the Harry S. Truman Library at Independence, Missouri. A mural painted by Thomas Hart Benton dominates the lobby. In this book, near the entrance, are listed the many generous citizens who financed the library and then donated it to the federal government in 1957. The hallway leading from the office to the exhibit room is lined with gifts received by the former president. Gem-encrusted swords were favorite gifts of foreign heads of state. This is what the president's oval-shaped White House office looked like during his administration. On the wall hangs a certificate of election in 1922 to his first public office, a county judgeship. On the other side of this sign is a legend for visitors with dubious propositions. It says, I'm from Missouri. Harry Truman's presidential years include the era of the atomic bomb, the beginning of the Cold War, and the establishment of the United Nations. The United Nations has been launched on its career. It must succeed. I know it will succeed. Before us now lies an era in which the power of atomic energy has been released. That age will either be one of complete devastation or one in which new sources of power will lighten the labors of mankind and increase the standard of living all over the world. The archives at Independence lure historians, biographers, and scholars from many nations. A scant 150 miles separates Independence, Missouri from Abilene, Kansas, site of the Eisenhower Center. Turned over to the federal government in May of 1962, it includes the museum, the Eisenhower family home, and the Dwight D. Eisenhower Library. The Eisenhower Library is a working headquarters for President Eisenhower on his frequent visits to Abilene. Directly across the courtyard is the Eisenhower Museum. In both the museum and library exhibit areas are displayed mementos and gifts acquired during a memorable career. This conference table from England was used by General Eisenhower and his staff while planning details of the Normandy invasion. The sweeping mural on the lobby walls depicts a career that led from soldier to educator to statesmen. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. Your deliberations and decisions during these somber years have already realized part of those hopes. Only three months after dedication of the Eisenhower Library, the Herbert Hoover Library came into being on the outskirts of the village of West Branch, Iowa. Museum collection and research facility are combined here, along with the faithful reproduction of his White House office. The Hoover inaugural medal, cast for the 31st president, hangs near the many honors bestowed upon the man who dedicated his life to public service and education. His keen interest in children led to the establishment of many boys' clubs across the nation. This concern for youth also prompted the Hoover missions to Russia and so many other countries in the grip of famine brought on by the destruction of war. All Europe is cold. Their food supply, of course, is below normal, and the suffering is intense. We must try to prevent starvation in other nations. We cannot escape the obligation to use our every resource to prevent starvation. Here are a few of the tokens of thanks from the children of Belgium, from the people of Russia, and the people of Germany. His many foreign missions led to the establishment of the Hoover Institution of War, Revolution, and Peace at Stanford University. In Herbert Hoover's words, the institution is not merely a library. 
through its staff for research and publication, it adds to the knowledge of history. It illuminates the dangers that surround us. It points out paths to freedom and peace and to the safe growth of the American way of life. Statesman, educator, humanitarian, the many faces of a great American will live on in his presidential library. Soon, with your help, on this site, a fifth presidential library will become a reality. It will never be a dead place, merely housing relics and papers of the past. That would not be fitting for John Kennedy, who was so intensely involved in life. It will grow and change with the times. Now he will not see the library to be erected in his name, but his parents and brothers and sisters and I all look on it as his memorial. We want a beautiful building to rise along the banks of the Charles. When that building is completed, it will be turned over to the government and will become the property of the people of the United States forever. My husband believes so strongly that one's aim should not just be the most comfortable life possible, but that we should all do something to right the wrongs we see and not just complain about them. We owe that to our country, and our country will suffer if we don't serve her. He believed that one man can make a difference, and that every man should try. That is why I know that the library will be the best memorial of all, the one which would have pleased him most, for it will be an institution which enlists young Americans and young people everywhere in the understanding and practice of democratic political life and service. You will now see some excerpts from the many films of the president, which will be available to scholars, students, and visitors at the library. Here, the people of free democratic Mexico came together to welcome the 35th president of the United States, to welcome their neighbor, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. In 1962, the heart of Mexico City, Plaza Mayor de la Constitución, where the sounds of history in the making echo and re-echo with the sounds of Mexico's ancient past. Universities are regarded as dangerous places for presidents, and we are grateful to you for your warm welcome to all of us on this occasion. Every one of us will go home with a most profound impression of what a strong, vital people can accomplish. And I think that this journey, that this journey to Costa Rica 
has illuminated the minds of 180 million people of what a great opportunity and privilege we have to be associated together in our common cause. Viva Costa Rica, Arriba Costa Rica, mucho gracias. Six presidents of the Isthmus reaffirmed the idea of the Declaration of Central America. President Orlik of Costa Rica said it another way. A new generation is arising here. They are the men of Latin America convinced that the revolution has not been wasted. It has only begun. President Dufoy Boigny, his wife, and the members of his party arrived at the White House for a state dinner given in their honor by President and Mrs. Kennedy. Every president since Thomas Jefferson has lived in the White House, which is part of the heritage of the American people, associated with the memory of great men and great events in the history of the Republic. The statue of Andrew Jackson, popular hero and president of 135 years ago, faces the front of the White House where President Boigny spent many hours in private conversation with President Kennedy. They discussed projects of economic cooperation between the two countries, especially in agriculture, fisheries, and regional developments. They discussed international problems, particularly the current situation in Africa below the center. 
President Kennedy said, from our talks, I've gained more knowledge and understanding of the problems facing your country and a deeper comprehension of the compelling forces that are shaping the new relationships among African states. A short distance from the wall and overlooking the east, the people of West Berlin welcomed a visitor, the President of the United States of America. many people in the world who really don't understand or say they don't what is the great issue between the free world and the communist world. Let them come to Berlin. Some who say that communism is the wave of the future, let them come to Berlin. And there are even a few who say that it's true that communism is an evil system but it permits us to make economic progress. Lass sie nach Berlin in common. Let them come. Freedom has 
with many difficulties. And democracy is not perfect. But we have never had to put a wall up to keep our people in to prevent them from leaving us. While the wall is the most obvious and vivid demonstration of the failures of the communist system, for all the world to see, we take no satisfaction in it, for it is, as your mayor has said, an offense not only against history, but an offense against humanity, separating families, dividing husbands and wives and brothers and sisters, and dividing a people who wish to be joined together. Freedom is indivisible. And when one man is enslaved, all are not free. All, all free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner.